I'm going to try to give you a little bit of ba of background about um, Parkinson's disease um, and how it goes through the body. And that might give you a little bit better idea about why things progress the way they do as you progress with Parkinson's. So, you know, first of all, it's a neurodegenerative disorder. And when I say that, that means that basically um, nerve cells are affected and, and more of them become affected over time and it gets worse over time. Um, and uh, that's because uh, cells become infected somehow, we don't know how, with um, abnormally pr folded proteins. Now, those proteins turn into something called Lewy body. And then as those Lewy bodies form, they start creating problems in the cells. So, um, so the abnormal folded protein is called alpha-synuclein. But, you know, this is a protein that is natural and normal in the nerve cells. It's just for some reason, at some point, they start folding abnormally, and then they turn into those Lewy bodies when they stick together. Um, and um, the uh, this picture here, I don't know if you can see it, shows a nerve cell. The bottom the bottom part of that picture is a nerve cell, and it has a big black blotch in it. And that's a okay. So that big purple cell at the bottom is a nerve cell and that big black blotch in the middle of it, that's the Lewy body, okay? That's where you get those abnormally folded alpha-synuclein mo molecules that are normal in a nerve cell but become somehow abnormally folded in Parkinson's patients and they glom together, create a Lewy body and your cells try to eat up, you know, try to break down those Lewy bodies like they would any other waste in your cells, but um, they're so big and unmanageable that they hurt the waste disposal system in your uh, nerve cells, and then the nerve cells die because everything's backing up. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Now, um, you know, there is a, um, a theory about how Parkinson's progresses, and uh, there was a German anatomist, uh, Heiko Brock, who came up with this theory called the Brock hypothesis, and he basically looked at bodies of patients, not necessarily yes. patients with Parkinson's who, who had died, and they looked for these abnormally folded proteins, the Lewy bodies and nerve cells, and they saw that there was a clear pattern to which nerves were affected, and um, they would often see uh, Lewy bodies in the nerve cells in the olfactory bulb, which are the nerve cells that help you smell, or they would see them in the nervous system surrounding the gut. Um, and they would see a clear progression of where the next nerve cells would be affected. And so let's move on to the next slide, Teresa. So basically we see this progression usually from, you know, the peripheral nervous system, like the nervous system around the gut to um, the brain stem, which is the bottom part of this slide, where it's the orange, the green, and the pink uh, arrows, that's the brain stem. Oops. One more, Teresa. Is it frozen? Teresa, is it frozen? Yeah, it is frozen. It took a okay. while for it to come up. My phone even, uh, I mean, uh, my voice to come over. I'm sorry okay, about that. Got but, it. Okay, so, so basically we see this progression of the abnormal nerves, you know, starting in the peripheral nervous system, going to the brain stem, which is that part that, you know, is, you know, where the orange, green, and pink arrows are. And then it slowly progresses out to the rest of your brain. So let's look at the um, the next slide. Um, so, you know, often before patients start having their typical Parkinson's symptoms of slowness and stiffness and tremor that they're they're usually diagnosed with Parkinson's at that point, 
they'll have symptoms that they don't realize are due to Parkinson's. So they'll have decreased sense of smell or constipation, or maybe they act out their dreams at night. Um, and these all occur because, you know, the, um, you know, for example, if you're acting out your dreams at night, your brain stem has been affected at that point. Or if you have constipation, then the cells surrounding your gut have been affected at that point. Or the decreased sense of smell, the olfactory bulb has been affected. Um, so let's go to the next slide. But at some point, when the, the abnormally folded proteins start affecting the top of your brain stem, uh, called the midbrain, um, that's when patients start getting the typical classic Parkinson's symptoms that we think of as the beginning stages of Parkinson's, which are slowness, stiffness, and tremor. Um, and let's go to the next slide. Now, that part of your brain, at the top of the brain stem, the midbrain, there's a portion called the substantia nigra, and that part of your brain produces dopamine, and it communicates with other nerve cells with dopamine. And when 80 the 60 to 80 percent of those cells have been destroyed. That's when patients start manifesting the typical symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Um, and that part of your brain helps you deal with or produce smooth and purposeful movements. OK, let's uh, go to the next slide. And that just shows you again where the substantia nigra is. It's just the pink base of that question mark, basically. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, a lot of the symptoms of Parkinson's, at least initially, are treated with um, medications that affect dopamine in some way because uh, those cells have been destroyed that produce dopamine. Um, and so, you know, carbidopa levodopa, the levodopa turns into dopamine or dopamine agonists like ropinerol or pramipexol, they basically mimic the shape of dopamine and affect the um receptors that um, respond to dopamine like they are dopamine. Or some of the other meds like um, risagiline or entecapone, those medications just uh, prevent dopamine from being broken down. So they, you know, basically affect the, um, the brain longer as if you have more dopamine in your system. So basically dopamine is what really treats the slowness and the stiffness and the tremor. Let's go to the next slide. So when people have mid-stage Parkinson's, it's usually because even more of those cells that produce dopamine have been destroyed and you start having some issues um, due to um, an, an even greater lack of dopamine. So let's go on to the next slide. So one of the, uh, so what we see are, is progression of the early symptoms. So maybe you just had tremor in your left hand initially. Well, that tremor might progress to your right side or to your legs, or it might occur more frequently um, or be more severe. Or your slow and stiff movements um, might affect larger parts of your body. Imbalance might intensify. And at this point, um, we just treat with more uh, medications like carbidopa levodopa or the dopamine agonist to try to get over those symptoms. And we'll treat with physical therapy to deal with the imbalance portion. Let's go to the next slide. But then patients also start to get motor fluctuations. And motor fluctuations um, is when patients experience an abrupt change in their ability to move. So when you're on uh, with uh, your medication. That means that you have good control of the slowness and the stiffness. And then sometimes people will just turn off where they have no control. Let's go to the next slide. So in the beginning stages, you don't really notice those off stages too much. They're very, they occur very gradually. And, you know, if they do occur, you can take meds and you recover pretty quickly from them usually. Um, but when you get to the mid stage of Parkinson's, you know, that levodopa lasts for a shorter period of time and you have to start dosing more frequently with carbidopa levodopa. Um, and part of that is because, like I said, you have fewer cells that produce dopamine, so you have to supplement with more medication. Uh, later stages are associated with even more unpredictable off periods. Let's go to the next slide. So this is a little graph that shows you what you might be experiencing when you have motor fluctuations. You know, you can see the, the white section of that chart basically shows you your symptoms are well controlled. The gray portion of that chart is an area where 
you feel off, like your medications have worn off. And then the pink area is going to be something that we talk about in a moment called dyskinesia, where you start getting side effects to the peak dose of medication right after you take it. Um, so initially for the first few years, zero to four years, you have, you take your meds, they go down, the, the, the serum level is elevated and then it drops again, but you don't really notice that you're off medication because, you know, you still have enough, uh, cells that produce dopamine to help supplement that. So you don't really experience it, but then maybe within four or five years, you start noticing that you're wearing off, um, as your medication starts coming towards the, the time that the next dose is due. And so you have, you're suddenly your tremor comes back and your slowness and stiffness, and it's more profound. And then later on, um, you know, when you're taking, you know, maybe seven or eight years on, you start getting dyskinesia after you take your meds, you take your meds, you get some improvement in your symptoms, and then you start getting side effects when you get to the peak dose of the medication. And as you get further along that, you can see that area where you're normal is like narrowing. You have a shorter period of time where you're normal and more time where you're being bothered by either being off or having dyskinesia, which is a side effect to the meds. Let's go to the next slide. So what do we do when people keep on going off uh, and on and off and on and it, um, it becomes more challenging? Well, like I said, you just take your carbidopa levodopa more frequently. So instead of taking it three times a day, maybe you're taking it four or five times per day. Or maybe you try a long acting form of carbidopa levodopa, like Ritari, or there's an older form called Cinemet CR that doesn't work as well, but sometimes we do that because Ritari is expensive. Um, or maybe you add on um, a medication that extends the duration of effect of the carbidopa levodopa that you take in addition to the carbidopa levodopa, like entecapone or risagiline or selegiline. Um, or maybe you take a recovery medication, which is something that's supposed to come into effect really quickly um, and get you back on uh, until your, your next dose of carbidopa levodopa takes effect. Um, or maybe you do deep brain stimulation surgery. We'll talk more about that one later. So let's go to the next slide. So one of the meds that a lot of my patients use is called Embresia. That's an, a recovery medication. It's basically levodopa. It's part, it's one of the components of carbidopa levodopa. And it's just something that turns immediately into dopamine. Um, it works faster than taking the, the tablet um, because uh, you have a lot of, it's an inhaled medication and you have a lot of blood vessels in your lungs. And so you can imagine the, the medication gets in into your blood system way faster that way. Um, there are other ones that are dopamine agonists, like kind of work the way that Rapinerol and Pramipexol work, but that are sublingual where you put it under your tongue or where you inject yourself. And, and the fastest one is probably the one that you inject, but they have their own quirks as well, um, including that they might be expensive. Okay, let's do the next slide. Okay, so now we'll talk briefly about dyskinesia. Um, I'm sure a lot of people know what this one is already. It's an irregular dance-like movement where you're kind of wiggling around. Um, it is a side effect of taking carbidopa levodopa. Usually people don't get it just on dopamine agonists like rapinerol or premipexol, but occasionally I've seen it on that alone. Um, and sometimes it'll just be an individual part of your body, like an arm or a leg that moves, but sometimes it's your entire body that sways. Next slide. Um, I'm not going to do the video cause I think that, uh, I can't make, I can't show Teresa the part I wanted to show you guys, but I guess I want you to just imagine if you remember what Michael J. Fox looks like. Sorry. When he's kind of, it's okay. Just stay there. When he's wiggling around, that's dyskinesia. Michael J. Fox is kind of a classic example of what dyskinesia looks like. Um, so what do we do to treat dyskinesia? Um, well, we reduce the dose of carbidopa levodopa. That's one way of dealing with it. But you can imagine that if you reduce the dose of carbidopa levodopa, your slowness and your stiffness and your tremor will get worse. So sometimes if we reduce the dose, we'll just give it more frequently. And sometimes giving it more frequently will kind of compensate for the lower dose amount. 
Or maybe we'll give you a medication like Ritari. Ritari is that long acting form of carbidopa levodopa. And the reason I prescribe that one for dyskinesia is because um, <clears throat> it has a, a, you know, you know how you take your meds and you have that peak amount in your, med, in your, in your bloodstream. Um, well, Ritari doesn't have as high of a peak. It stays more steady most of the time. And so you don't get the side effects as much because you're not getting too much in your bloodstream. Uh, the only issue with Ritari is that it's not always covered by insurance. And that can be one of the great limitations for that one. Um, and sometimes, you know, often my first line therapy uh, after considering lower doses of levodopa will be to give you a medication called amantadine, which is an old flu treatment. Um, and that medication, um, for whatever reason, also helps reduce dyskinesia. Um, or maybe we consider deep brain stimulation surgery, which we'll talk about in a moment. So, uh oh. Hmm. Glitchy, everybody. So sorry. Where are we at? Right here? Yeah. I think every time you open it, it makes you go through the whole thing anyway. Oh, there it yeah. is. Okay. So deep brain stimulation surgery. It's basically a surgery where they take thin metal wires, electrodes that they put in your brain. And, um, and at the very tip of where those electrodes are inserted, you can be stimulated with electricity. And that electricity helps reduce tremor that's poorly controlled with medication or dyskinesia. Um, it can also help with something called dystonia that we'll talk about briefly. And it doesn't eliminate your off periods, but it can make the off periods less severe. But it's not for everyone. It sounds in some ways wonderful, although horrifying because it's a brain surgery. But um, it's it, it does work very well for many people. But there are certain people that we don't want to get it because it can worsen imbalance and cognitive impairment. So if you already have those issues, I wouldn't necess I wouldn't recommend the surgery for you. And this is, you know, not my best photo that I could find, but a photo I found of what the electrodes look like and what the wires look like. And basically you can see two short little wires going into the brain. They're attached to a, a wire that goes under the scalp and it connects to a pacemaker like device in the chest wall. Um, obviously all of the, the wires are hidden under your skin um, and that's what it should look like. Um, another symptom that people can have at mid-stage is dystonia. Now, some people get dystonia early on as their first manifestation. That tends to be younger patients, but a lot of patients won't get dystonia until mid-stage. Uh, dystonia is an uncontrolled contraction of muscles, and they often lead to abnormal posturing of a limb. Um, for me, when I see my patients with it, the most common presentation will be toe flexion or extension that's very uncomfortable. Um, less commonly, it'll present as arm, uh, abnormal arm posturing or neck flexion um, or ankle torsion. Um, and it's usually a symptom when patients wear off of their carbidopa levodopa. It's on the off state that people experience that. But sometimes people will have it in a way that's called diphasic. That means they get the dystonia as their meds start working and as they start wearing off. So this is just a photo I found online of an example of dystonia, and, and it's not totally unusual for my patients to have this. As you can see, the right foot, uh, you're looking at it, it'll be on your left side uh, of the photo, uh, the right foot of this person, the toes are flexed, and on the left side, you can see some extension and flexion going on. And so how do we treat that? Well, you know, if it's an off phenomenon, sometimes just giving you a better dose of Carbidopa levodopa will help. Um, like I said, deep brain stimulation surgery is a treatment, although that's kind of an extreme one if dystonia is the only symptom you have. Um, usually we go for the intermediary uh, treatment of Botox or botulinum toxin injections. Um, so botulinum toxin is a toxin that's produced by bacteria. Um, if you're unlucky and you eat you know, improperly canned food, you could ingest uh, botulinum toxin and become totally paralyzed. 
and that's not good. But, um, you know, pharmaceutical companies figured out how to make, um, produce uh, like a clean version of this, a sterile version of it. And um, when we give it in very small amounts in focal parts of the body, it helps reduce the tension. It relaxes the muscles. It actually weakens them in that part of the body. And, um, and it lasts for about three months and then it wears off and then you have to come back again and do it again. And, you know, um, we also note that um, not just the physical changes of, you know, on and off and dy dystonia and dyskinesia happening at mid-stage, but we notice non-motor features, okay? Those are things that are like um, your mood might become affected, which it would be appropriate in the setting of having Parkinson's disease, which is a chronic disorder, but also the um, you might have mood disorders partially related to changes to the brain um, from Parkinson's disease itself. Uh, people also can have changes in their voice where they become quiet or slurred. They can have difficulty swallowing. Constipation become, can become a big problem for some people. Uh, some people get something called orthostatic hypotension where they feel like they're going to pass out when they stand up. And that can also be a big problem. Uh, you can get urinary incontinence. You can have insomnia. You can drool. Um, those are the big ones, but there are a few other things that I'm just not going to go over. So, you know, the way we treat the non-motor symptoms is really very specific to the symptom itself. And it does, those, those symptoms don't respond to Parkinson's medications that affect dopamine levels because those symptoms are not related to dopamine usually. You know, they're, they're unrelated because, like I said, as I showed you in the beginning, initially you start having the symptoms of part, the motor symptoms of Parkinson's because that one specific part of your brain, the substantia nigra has been affected. But when um, it starts going out to other parts of your brain, there are other symptoms you're going to start having that don't respond to dopamine because those cells that are being affected elsewhere in the brain are not controlled by dopamine. So, you know, if you have mood symptoms, we'll treat you like anyone else who has depression, although we'll keep in mind that you have Parkinson's and try to avoid antidepressants that affect cognition, you know. So often my go-to meds are sertraline or Wellbutrin. Um, if you have voice changes, I recommend speech therapy. If you have difficulty swallowing, I'll recommend speech therapy. And often we'll get a swallow study with that just to make sure there isn't a treatable cause for your difficulty swallowing. I mean, I want to make sure you don't have a constriction in there from something else that's unrelated to Parkinson's uh, and make sure there isn't something that we can treat easily. Um, or if you have constipation, diet changes, exercise, you know, um, more fluids. And then I always recommend Miralax. Um, and after that, it's basically anything you can find over the counter. If you have lightheadedness when you stand up, orthostatic hypotension, you know, one of the first things we do is try to adjust your blood pressure meds if you're on any. We stop those. I'm okay with you having a slightly elevated blood pressure or even a systolic blood pressure up to one, you know, below 180 if necessary in order for you to not pass out with Parkinson's, you know. Um, so, um, so we'll stop blood pressure meds or other meds that drop your blood pressure or we'll reduce your Parkinson's meds like carbidopa, levodopa, which also drops your blood pressure. Or, you know, obviously we'll also, you know, recommend that you do things that are um, less invasive, like adding on more fluids and salt and wearing compression hose. When all else fails, sometimes we have to give you meds to increase your blood pressure, like mitodrine or flucocortisone. Um, if you have urinary symptoms, um, if you're really complex with prostate issues, I'll probably send you to urology. But if it's straightforward urinary urgency, then I'll try some meds on you myself and see what works. Um, Merbetric is one that has the fewest side effects. So I like that the most, but it is expensive sometimes. And then um, if you have problems sleeping, you know, there are some meds that we can try. And if there's drooling, again, that's another thing that we often use Botox for. I'll, I'll Botox the parotid glands, which are in your cheeks. And that sometimes helps to dry up the secretions. Um, rarely I'll use medications like atropine drops that you can take orally uh, because um, that those do run the risk of causing hallucinations. And I don't want to create a problem. 
Uh, and then at some point we get to advanced disease where imbalance and cognitive impairment really become the most prominent features. You know, uh, patients with Parkinson's often have problems walking mildly from the start, but at some point that shuffling gait starts turning into freezing where you really can't pick your feet up well. And maybe freezing occurs occasionally in the mid stages, but towards the later stages, freezing occurs, you know, all the time and it's unpredictable. Um, and sometimes you will walk and you won't be able to stop your legs from moving. So the opposite can occur and then you fall because your body's uh, in motion when you don't want it to be. And then people start having frequent falls at that point. And we're going to ignore that. I was just going to show you what freezing is, but I don't, I can't do the video right now. Um, so how do we treat imbalance? You know, well, you know, obviously we try to optimize the carbidopa levodopa and see if we can make you on with your meds as much as possible. But despite making you as optimally treated as possible, patients will still freeze and often it's medication independent. Um, and so really our best way to treat that becomes physical therapy and often physical therapists will recommend assistive devices like walkers and in the worst case, wheelchairs. Um, patients will also have cognitive impairment. Again, that's another thing that can be very mild initially, but over time becomes more prominent. Um, and patients will have short-term recall issues, difficulty focusing, um, it starts becoming concerning when it affects your ability to do your complex daily activities like managing finances, driving a car, managing your medications, and making meals. That's when I start. you start getting in, into the dementia territory, okay? And, and sometimes at this point, people will start having psychosis, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, so how do we treat, you know, dementia um, in Parkinson's disease? Well... Uh, I often treat with cholinesterase inhibitors. Those are medications that were initially approved for Alzheimer's disease, but also work quite well for Parkinson's. Now, not everyone responds to those meds, but it's it's um, a lot of patients do. So I usually think it's a good start. There's another medication called Nemenda or Memantine, which also is an Alzheimer's medication. Uh, I'll, tr I'll try that in some patients, although I feel like it works less well. Um, Exercise still is helpful at that stage for cognition, and so is interacting with other people. So you really, it's been hard this year to interact with other people, but it is recommended that you do try to find a way to stay um, positive. And then, you know, you start getting outside of the meds and thinking about, you know, what are the lifestyle changes that you can make that can help your life? Um, you know, how do you organize your meds? Maybe you need to have someone help you organize your meds. You probably need to stop driving. You know, maybe you need to have some support um, in the house. Uh, we're going to talk about psychosis briefly. That's just one of the symptoms that can occur with Parkinson's disease dementia. Psychosis basically is um, when patients start having hallucinations usually um, in their visual hallucinations most of the time, although occasionally auditory. Um, less commonly, patients can have delusions. Um, delusions are where you have kind of a fixed belief that's not, that's unlikely, like you think that um, someone's uh, changed all the furniture in your house when really no one's changed the furniture in your house, um, or you think the FBI is out to get you. Um, so usually when people have um, Parkinson's related hallucinations or psychosis, it's more mild and it's usually not bothersome for the vast majority of people where they just think they see a shadow in the corner of their vision or they, they feel like there's someone behind them and then they look and there's no one there. Um, occasionally someone will see like a cat or a dog. Um, and they, um, but, but usually people are aware that it's not real. So they, you know, if, so let's go to the next slide. We'll talk about that. What do we do when people have these symptoms? Well, if the symptoms are not bothersome, we ignore them. Uh, but if they do become bothersome, then I start taking away the kind of extra medications that I used to treat, uh, Parkinson's with. So I'll take away like the dopamine agonists like uh, rapinerol or primapexol, or we'll take away amantadine that treats dyskinesia, or we'll take away entecapone or maybe oxybutynin, which treats urinary symptoms. We'll just take away anything else that can kind of make you more confused. 
And if that doesn't work, then we'll start reducing your carbidopa levodopa, which also can contribute to confusion. And then often denepazil, that, that Alzheimer's medication will reduce some of the symptoms. Or if worse comes to worse, um, then sometimes I'll treat with an antipsychotic like quetiapine or nuplazid. Uh, and finally, you know, at some point, you, like I said, you kind of want to start thinking about getting some assistance. That might mean that I send home health to your home and they assess for safety. Like, do you need to move that rug that you keep on tri tripping on? Or do you need to widen your doorway so you can get a walker through? Um, or a social worker will speak with you. We have a social worker with our group here at St. Vincent's, but also um, Parkinson's Resources of Oregon has a social worker who can kind of advise you on, you know, what are your next options? They might be able to tell you about caregivers that you can get into the home, like uh, visiting angels that you can pay for, or maybe you need to start thinking about assisted living where you move out of your home, you know? And so um, I did ask, that we have an attorney speak with you guys tonight because I think that um, one of the most important things to think about is end of life considerations like estate planning because um, I sometimes see when people have not made plans ahead of time and it becomes a real mess. And so I think it's important to kind of set your goals before you start having problems thinking uh, so that it's very clear and your family knows what you want to do if you can't speak for yourself in terms of your medical and in terms of your financial decisions. Um, I think, you know, that's basically it. Um, I think basically the, the thing I'm trying to tell you is that it's good to kind of um, work with a movement disorder neurologist to kind of understand what your limitation, what the limitations are of the disease and what we can treat. Um, and we try to take care of whatever we can. And if we can't, at least, you know, you don't, you're not, you're not keeping, tr trying to push up against something um, and trying to get a solution for something that we might not have a solution for, but also that you kind of plan ahead and make sure that you have all of your legal things set for the future. That's it. Do you have questions? Yes, so we do have a couple of questions. Let me go over to that button here. So um, one question came back up earlier and it was uh, talking about if there is an adverse effect, if you increase the medication prematurely before end stage. So I'm going to say that was more around probably, I think you covered it really, um, around increasing, you know, like the levodopas and everything like that, and then you got the side effects, and then that's when we move from mid to advanced, where unfortunately you start having to play around with removing some. Um, yeah. Do you have anything else with that? or? I, I just think there's like a constantly moving target with your medications and it's going to change constant it's going to change over time uh, you know uh one uh, you know i think studies have been done to indicate that taking levodopa does not cause long-term damage and so there's no such thing as taking too much too soon for the most part um you know we really try to um give you the best quality of life so you might need to be depending on who you are you might need to be on fairly high doses of medication in order to get the best quality of life that you can get and at some point you will start having side effects. And when that occurs, then we start modifying the amount of medication we give you. And maybe we, maybe we walk it back. That's not uncommon, especially in the advanced stages. Awesome. And then uh, there's another one, Dr. O'Leary. It had to do about dystonia. The question was, does the toe flexion hurt the patient? Is it can. Some people get really bugged by it, you know, and it might not be like horribly painful, but it might just be like this constant ache or some people, they can't wear shoes or certain shoes because their toe keeps on rubbing under their shoe and poking out and it's bugging them. Yeah. So taking this information, would you say that it also applies to those with multiple system atrophy? Well, ooh, that's an mm -hmm. atypical Parkinsonian disorder. Um, there are many of the things I talked about are true for multiple systems atrophy. Basically, we have the same meds that we use for Parkinson's that we use for that disorder. But there are certain meds that, you know, there are just a lot more limitations because carbidopa levodopa causes such severe drops in blood pressure with multiple systems atrophy that we're often stuck in terms of treating the actual Parkinson's symptoms and 
some patients can only be, just get rehab for those symptoms. But then the non-motor features of depression and, you know, drooling or who knows what are still treated like you would a normal Parkinson's patient. Okay. Well, I think that's it with the questions. That was great. I really appreciate the information you shared with us. Um, oh, it looks like somebody threw one in real quick. <laughs> Got two minutes. All right. So how about, um, do Parkinson's patients take advantage of Oregon's assisted O death options? Um, I, th I think occasionally they do. I think it's been a while since I've had to investigate this. First of all, Providence, you know, is a Catholic institution, so they don't let us really talk too much about that. Um, you know, I usually advise yeah. patients if they want to know about that, that they go to uh, speak with their primary care physician or look it up online. And there, there are resources where you can speak with people directly about that. Um, but uh, it's possibly an option. I think the limitation might be if... Um, you know, it has to be, it, Parkinson's is such a long disease process and, you know, it has to be a terminal illness. And so when do you say that Parkinson's becomes a terminal illness? And, and at that point, does the patient have the cognitive reserves to be able to make a decision about physician assisted suicide? So can we squeeze one more question in and then after this, maybe I can send to you and uh, if we have time for you to respond back before I send out my email, I can send your answers. But one more, uh, what is your opinion on other surgical treatments uh, such as lesioning techniques? At this point, I mean, yeah. So at this point, we don't think they work as well as DBS because uh, deep brain stimulation, you can modify exactly where you're stimulating someone and you can increase or decrease the voltage based. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes, it does. Okay. All right. So I'm going to be talking about what it means to be an elder law attorney. Uh, from my perspective, obviously, elder law is an umbrella term, and it covers many, many areas of law. And I just want to tell you what my perspective is on this today. Elder law is estate planning, first and foremost. We help our clients with wills, trust, powers of attorney, advanced directives, all of those really important documents that help you to plan for the future. But while... Um, while most estate planning attorneys, their focus is on what happens when you die, elder law attorneys recognize that there's a lot of life before death. And that with that life, there often come these types of life events that most of us haven't really, didn't expect, didn't plan for. Whether it's Parkinson's, whether it's dementia, whether it's a stroke or some kind of an accident, all of these things lead to not just our physical uh, and medical problems, but we also have serious uh, financial and legal problems that stem from these events. And elder law attorneys are hypersensitive to these types of issues. We want to help our clients to plan for what happens if whatever happens to me leads to long-term care. Uh, leads to me losing capacity and unable to make decisions for myself. Who can make those decisions for me? And what kind of decisions will they be making? And what is all of this going to cost me in the future, right? It's all, these are all really important questions. So we understand that it's just as important to plan to live as it is to plan to die. So, with that, what's the problem? There are there are many problems that come along with aging, but the ones that uh, I see most commonly are going to be um, that we don't have the legal documents in place that give authority to another person to make decisions for us. Um, and when there are legal documents in place, there is an unfortunate uh, amount of elder abuse that occurs. And then also what happens if we need long-term care. So I do wanna to touch just briefly on all three of these things today. I do wanna mention, and I'll mention again at the end, if you're interested in the full presentation, we do offer monthly presentations. They're all via Zoom. 
and quite a few less people usually on ours, so it's not as glitchy, but um, we do this every month, and you're welcome to go to our website at roseelderlaw.org and sign up for those free presentations. So let's move on to what happens if I don't have a plan in place and I lose my mental capacity? If I'm no longer able to make decisions for myself, who has the authority to make those decisions for me? Very naturally, most people think that if I'm married, oh, my spouse has authority to make decisions for me. My spouse will be able to manage finances, manage you know, debt obligations, etc. Many years ago, when my wife and I moved into a new apartment, we were very newly married, and I was in a rush to set up the utilities. And I, I got everything set up, and a few months later, my wife called me and said, hey, I'm trying to pay the electric bill, but they're telling me that they can't speak to me. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean they're saying they can't speak to you? And she said, well, they said I'm not on the account, and so they won't speak to me or even take my payment. Now, there, it may be that others of you have had this experience, but this example goes to show you that just because you're married to somebody doesn't mean that you have legal authority to manage their finances, their debt obligations or contractual obligations. These this can be a serious problem, and this is what we hear a lot from people coming into our office. I am I have been asked by my father to take care of these obligations, but I'm not able to do so without a power of attorney. So the reality is that if you lose capacity and you don't have a, an estate plan in place, we're going to have to go to the court and ask a judge to appoint a guardian and or a conservator over you to manage those obligations for you. Um, in addition, it may mean that you'll lose important benefits that you're otherwise entitled to. And your spouse may lose their estate trying to pay for your care. These are very serious consequences from not having a proper estate plan in place. Okay. So just to touch on guardianship and conservatorship briefly, what is that? What is the process? The guardian is a court appointed fiduciary who will manage all of your care for the rest of your life. They get to say where you live. They're going to talk to the doctors and determine what kind of treatment you're going to receive, what kind of medications you're going to take. Um, they even get to choose things like what's your diet going to be and who gets to visit you. The conservator is a person who's appointed by the court to manage your finances. If you have assets that are valued over $10,000 and you're unable to manage them, then the court will appoint a conservator to manage those finances for you. What's really important about all of this are a couple of things. The first is the cost. It is very expensive to get a guardian and conservator appointed for you. At a minimum, it's gonna cost around $4,000. I would say that the average is closer to 5,000. So we say anywhere from 4,000 to 5,500. We have a couple of conservatorships, guardianships that, um, that we're working on right now, and the cost just to get them set up and going have exceeded $7,000. Um, we had one last year that exceeded $12,000. And it's all because of the process. We have to deal with a court. We have to send out notice to all of your family members, all of those people who are close to you, that a guardianship and conservatorship has been initiated. You are allowed to object to that proceeding, as are the other people that you're close to. So when other people object to the proceeding, now we're going to go to court, an attorney is going to be appointed for you, your loved one, your other loved ones may have attorneys appointed for them, and, uh, and whoever's filed the petition 
will have their attorney. So as you can see, with all of these attorneys getting involved, it gets expensive very, very quickly. Um, so in, in addition to that, for the rest of your life, your fiduciary will have to file uh, reports with the court a guardian report and a conservator's report. And those costs can exceed $1,000 every year or more. And the problem with all this, of course, is that if you're the person that we're trying to protect, you are the one that pays the bill for all of this stuff. So it gets really expensive and it's really unfortunate. Um, the last part of this, of course, is that when, when a judge determines that you are incapacitated and in need of protection, what they're really saying is we are stripping you of your constitutional and God-given rights to make your own decisions about where you're going to live, uh, what kind of treatment you're going to receive, how you're going to manage your finances. We're taking those rights away from you and we're giving them to somebody else. And that's a big deal, right? That's a, that's a really... A really big deal and maybe some of you have heard of this i hope i hope this doesn't cause too much angst but i haven't come up in in every presentation recently about uh, the show on netflix i care a lot right and this is um this is a uh this is one of those shows where of course it's it's mostly fiction but some of it you know there is some reality to the show where a court appointed fiduciary is taking advantage of the person that they were are supposed to protect. So at the end of the day, most people want to avoid the guardianship and conservatorship and for good reason. They want to avoid the public humiliation. When, when we file a, a petition in a court, it's all public information. Um, they want to avoid the costs. They want to avoid all of the family stress um, and, and knowing that their rights are going to be taken from them. So how can we prevent that? What can we do to protect ourselves? Well, the, uh, the answer is simply to get the right documents in place. And that is, at, at minimum, having a power of attorney and an advanced directive in place. These two documents are your most important. As far as I'm concerned, they're your most important documents because they protect you while you're alive. Most of these other documents really are geared towards protecting the estate and, and making sure you pass it on to the next generation. And while that's important, it's just as important, if not more important, that we protect you while you're alive. Now, there's some really important points about the power of attorney. And if you've ever seen me present in the past, you will know that this is my soapbox because the power of attorney um, is so screwed up so often, so frequently, it is a tragedy. And I, what I want you to know is that there's no such thing as a one size fits all power of attorney document in the state of Oregon, okay? Most people assume, oh, I have a power of attorney document. I've got enough. But listen to me really quick. Just tune in for just one second and understand there is no such thing as a one size fits all power of attorney document in the state of Oregon. What does that mean? It means that your document should be drafted for you and your circumstances. What is the power of attorney document? It is very literally an employment contract between you as the employer and your designated agent or your employee. When I give power of attorney to my wife to act on my behalf, if something happens to me, if I'm unable to manage my own finances, what I'm saying is, Holly, I'm hiring you to be my agent. Now, while I've got capacity, while I have the ability to make my own choices, I may direct her to do something on my behalf. Maybe I go out of the country, right when we're trying to sell our house, documents need to be signed. I can tell my wife to sign the documents as power of attorney on my behalf. 
but when I lose my mental capacity, when I'm no longer able to make decisions for myself, then she will act on my behalf and make the kinds of decisions that she believes I would make. This is what we call substitute decision making. When you hire somebody to be your agent under power of attorney, you should be hiring the person that you believe will fulfill your wishes, will make the kinds of decisions that you want to, to be made. More on that in just a second. Just to finish up what the power of attorney is, how it works, a power of attorney must be in writing and it should be notarized. There is no legal requirement to have the document notarized, but you will find many, many problems if you use a document that, where the signatures were not notarized. Why? We want to see authenticity. We want to know that this document is a, a very real document. It's authentic. It was signed by you. And if your agent takes that document to the bank or some other third party institution to try to use it, the first thing they want to know is, is this an authentic document? Did you really sign it? And the notary adds that level of security to know, hey, this person really signed this document. This is the person who they are the person they who they said they were right when they signed this document. So it's really important to have the document notarized. Another important point, power of attorney ceases to work when you die. Why? Because remember, this is an employment contract. When the employer dies, the employee is out of work. I've had many people call me or come to my office and say, my mom passed away, but I'm her power of attorney. And unfortunately, that means nothing at that point. And I have to tell them, at this point, we need to know, are you the successor trustee of her trust or are you the executor of her estate? Because your authority ceased when mom passed away. And last but not least, and mostly important, is this strictly construed piece. In Oregon, your power of attorney document will be strictly construed. That means that if you want your agent to have a specific power, a specific authority, it must be explicitly stated in your document. This goes back to the idea that there is no one size fits all power of attorney document in the state of Oregon. Very often, I have people call my office and say, I'm power of attorney for my dad and we want to do long-term care planning. And first question I have to ask is, can I see the power of attorney document? Why? I want to know what authority this agent has been given. And what I see all too often are power of attorney documents that came from online or the bookstore that are these generic documents that were not prepared for this particular client, but they just pick them up very cheaply from the bookstore online, even for free. And when I review the document, it, it, there's, there's no grant of authority in the document to allow me as an attorney to help the person, the agent, do what they're trying to do. So this is a very, very important point. Your document should be prepared for you. Okay, so a couple more. Uh, oh yeah, this slide on uh, strictly construed. Um, your power of attorney document should say exactly what you want your agent to say. Uh, to that point, I see a lot of one-page power of attorney documents, or you know, even even three or four-page power of attorney documents. At our office, as elder law attorneys, again, being hypersensitive to the issues that our clients face, at a minimum, our power of attorney documents are going to be around 11 pages long, and the vast majority of them are closer to 20 pages, if not even up to 30 pages long. We want to give our agent as much authority as possible. We want them to have a broad range of authority to take care of anything and everything that, um, that you may need. Now, that is, of course, um, a potential for trouble, right? 
this is really important that um, we understand that you're giving literally the keys to your kingdom to somebody else. They could wipe out your bank account and run off to Mexico. I had one little old lady come into my office and say I gave power of attorney to my daughter. She moved me into my garage and is now renting my house out to strangers. It was horrific. And that's not even the worst case we've seen, but it was terrible. And we had to go in and start threatening daughter with all kinds of stuff. And it was really bad. But power of attorney is the most common form of elder abuse. Most people will give power of attorney to a person that maybe they feel some obligation to, like my, my uh, oldest child. They're my oldest child. I need to give them the power of attorney. No, you don't. Think about it. Who is going to be the best person for this job? Don't give them the job out of some kind of loyalty or obligation. If they have financial difficulties, do not give them power of attorney. It would be very unfair for you to assume that they can manage your money better than they manage their own. You might want to consider their age, their family dynamics, etc. Here's a really important point that I want to make about um, about the power of attorney document. Again, you can say whatever you want in the document, but sometimes you can go too far. You can say too much. So sometimes it's just as important what you don't say in your document. That can be just as important as what you do say. And an example of that is uh, a woman that came to my office a few years ago. Her mother was has dementia. She's on what I call the de dementia roller coaster. And as uh, you may know, those who are dealing with dementia will often be very clear. Um, they will understand what's going on in the moment. They'll be able to hold a conversation. But in the next moment, they'll be very unclear. They won't know what's going on or what's happening. And she related to me that mom was not paying any of her bills but was giving away all her money to people on the phone and on the internet. And she was horrified. She was terrified for her mother that she, her mother was going to go into the poorhouse very, very quickly. And so she dug through mom's papers and found a power of attorney document. Mom went to an attorney in Lake Oswego many years ago and got this beautifully drafted power of attorney document. But as she read the document, there was a clause in there that said, my agent does not have authority until two doctors declare me to be incapacitated. What? This is what we call a springing power of attorney, okay? Springing power means that the power does not exist or it springs to life when uh, a condition occurs. That condition is that a doctor declares me to be incapacitated. So daughter took her mother to the doctor the doctor evaluated her, but unfortunately for daughter, when mom went to the doctor, mom was on her A game, the top of the roller coaster, and she was answering all the questions. And every doctor that, that this daughter took her mother to said, yes, we know she has dementia, but we still think she's able to manage her own finances. And that was really unfortunate. She came to me and said, what do I do? And I said, well, you only have one option at this point, and that is to get a conservatorship for your mother. What just happened here? Mom paid good money to an attorney to set up a very nice power of attorney document that ended up failing. Be very, very careful. I don't like springing power of attorney documents for this very reason. And I can give you more, a lot more uh, examples of this that I don't have time to do right now, but be very careful. If you have a power of attorney document right now, review it. First of all, determine who your agent is and is that really the person you want as your agent? And also look for this clause that says my agent can't do anything until a doctor has um, declared me incapacitated. I will say that this springing power gives our clients this warm and fuzzy feeling inside. They like this idea, oh, okay, my agent can't do anything until I've been declared incapacitated, but there is some, there, there is a, uh, a breakdown in logic there. Let me just make this point. If you cannot trust your agent while you have capacity, 
while you get the bank statements and can see that they're siphoning off money or they have posted a for sale sign in your yard, what makes you think you can trust them when you don't have capacity? It's so important that you pick the right person to be your agent under power of attorney. Now, for married couples, your spouse is almost always going to be your agent under power of attorney first, and then you'll have some backups. So for a lot of the, those of you who are married, that's a, a really easy call. But for those of you who are not, it can be more difficult. Going back to this idea of I care a lot, <laughs> there are a lot of professional fiduciaries in our community that are awesome. And I deal with them every day. They, they do care about their clients and they do an exceptional job at taking care of them, providing the care that they need. And I highly recommend that. So if you don't have somebody in your life that you trust to take over power of attorney, we can, we can at least recommend a handful to you. You can either get a private fiduciary, you can get somebody that belongs to a business, a company that does this, or a bank. And all of those can be really good options. Okay, so to wrap this up again, um, to make the point a little more clear, it really matters what type of power of attorney document you get. Ultimately, most people that come to my office with power of attorney, the thing that they're trying to accomplish is planning for long-term care. Uh, very frequently, it's a husband and wife who one of, the, one of those uh, persons is needing long-term care and the spouse is terrified that the cost of long-term care are going to put them in the poor house. And we need to know what does the power of attorney document allow us to do on this ill person's behalf? And as an attorney, there's a lot we can do to help protect an estate, a lot. But we are limited if the power of attorney is limited. The, the authority we have is the authority that's been given in that power of attorney document. So be careful. You can absolutely get a power of attorney document from a bookstore. You can get it online. You can get it from another attorney that doesn't practice elder law. But if they don't practice elder law, I can guarantee you almost every time the provisions that we need in order to protect an estate are not going to be in that document. And I have to turn people away every week. And it's really unfortunate. Okay. So um, to, I know we're about out of time here, uh, just to wrap things up with the advanced directive, also an incredibly important document. And the best part about this document is it is statutory. Um, it is a one size fits all and it is free. You can get it just about anywhere. In fact, you can go to my website and download it for free. And I highly recommend you do that. If you come to our office and want to do an estate planning package, we always throw in the advanced directive as part of the package. We don't charge extra for it. But it's an incredibly important document and something that you should take very seriously when you fill it out. This document incorporates both the durable power of attorney for healthcare, where you nominate an agent to make decisions for you, as well as where you tell us what you want with regard to life support and tube feeding. That's the living will part. Um, I have more to cover. I just want to say as a, 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 a in parting in that is that, again, we do have free seminars coming up. There's one coming up on May 4th here this next week on estate planning where I'll cover these same issues plus more. They're about an hour and a half long. There will be more time to ask questions. The next one is on long term care, how to qualify for Medicaid benefits to pay for care and not go broke. And then um, last but not least, we do, for those who attend our, our seminars, you're welcome to take advantage of a free 30 minute consultation. It's a $133 value. Um, it is extremely limited. We have very limited spots for the, the free 30 minute consultation, but you're very welcome to call the office and, and um, sign up for that. We'd be happy to meet with you. We do expect that you'll fill out the questionnaire. Having the questionnaire filled out is 
um, so important for us. Just like if you're going to the doctor's office, they're going to ask you to fill out a questionnaire. But having that information will make that 30 minutes well worth your time. It'll be so much easier for us to be able to help you in, in knowing how to plan. So that's it. Thank you, Teresa. Oh, that was awesome, uh, Michael. I have some questions. They were kind of okay. and, and, and I was tempted to answer some, but I'm going to leave it to you. Okay. So let's see if I can hear a little background on that. Okay. 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 You hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I can barely hear you. Sorry. Yeah, there's yeah, there's there's a lot of background sounds in here. Let me check something. I can see a couple of the questions that are okay. on there. Um, let's see here. I see power attorney types survive death. Okay, so power of attorney and types that may survive death. There are no power of attorney types that survive death. What you need is either a trust or a will at that point. So you want to have uh, one of those documents in place that says what happens to your state when you die and who has the authority at that point to take over. And the trust is obviously the better choice because your agent or your, your successor trustee can step right into your shoes. They don't have to hire an attorney and petition a court to be appointed as an executor. A lot of people think that if they have a will that they're the person they've named as executor has authority right away. And that is false. They have to hire an attorney. They have to petition a court to be appointed as the executor of your estate before they get authority to do anything. Is there a need for a guardian and conservatorship if there's a durable power of attorney covering? Exactly, right? I think we covered that question. That's the point. If the if you have a guardian, if you have a power of attorney and an advanced directive, our hope is that you will be able to avoid the guardianship and conservatorship. But as you saw with my example, you can have these documents in place and they may still fail. They still fail not all the time infrequently, but they still fail because they were either not drafted correctly or there is some other problem. And I don't have time to get into all the details of what the other problems are, but believe me, there's a lot of them. I will say that most power of attorney documents work just great and that's exactly what they do exactly what we want them to do. What are the tests or questions to consider if someone no longer has capacity to make decisions for themselves? So that's going to be up to each attorney. When um, when I'm helping a client, I want to know: Do they know who their family members are? Do they do they know what the value of their estate is? Where their accounts are? Um, what the value of those accounts are? I'm going to ask a lot of questions to determine whether or not my client actually has capacity to sign legal documents. But I will say that, you know, capacity, again, there's a roller coaster thing going on there. And I've met with people who clearly have dementia, but in the moment they were, they were clear as a bell. They were able to tell me everything that was going on in their life. And I knew then that they could sign a power of attorney document. And so oftentimes when clients will call me and say, well, I need to do a power of attorney document, but I've got dementia, I say, well, what's the best time of day for you, right? Are you better in the mornings? Are you better in the afternoons? And there are, you know, it may not work in every case, but I found that chocolate can do wonders for the memory. And that, that if you'll have a little piece of chocolate before we talk about 15 minutes prior, uh, it, it just helps perk people up and, that can be really helpful as long as you're you have the ability to answer my questions. And if somebody, you know, a judge puts me on a stand to testify, as long as I can honestly say this person had capacity in that moment, that's really what's going to matter. Is a power of attorney from California legal in Oregon? Yes, it is. The question is better asked. Will it do what I need it to do in Oregon? And the question is maybe. We don't really know. We don't really know what your background circumstances are, what your assets look like, what your liabilities are. California has a statutory form power of attorney. That means it's a one size fits all. In California, 
it probably will cover everything you need. In Oregon, it almost certainly will not. And I say that because I just reviewed another power of attorney from California, which I do on a regular basis because we have lots of lovely Californians moving up here. I, I was born in California, by the way. Um, my, but every, all my family's from Oregon. I was born in California. But at any rate, I'll just say that most of those documents will be insufficient when it comes to long-term care planning. Let's see. I think that's it. Bad echo. Well, hopefully that took care of itself. But anyway, if there's any other questions, feel free to sign up for the three free 30 minute consultation. Like I said, they're extremely limited. Um, there are a lot of people on this call today. If you're interested in it, call right away. Um, they're already booked up through through next month. Um, and, uh, and it may be a while before you're able to get in, but we'd be more than happy to talk to you.